Hello and welcome. This is Zen and the Art of Adversarial Machine Learning. My name is Will Pierce. I'm the Red Team Lead for the Azure Trustworthy Machine Learning Team. And together with my colleagues, our job is to assess machine learning models at Microsoft and with partners. And I'm joined today by Giorgio Saveri. Hello, everyone. I'm Giorgio. I'm a PhD student at Northeastern University, and my research focuses on securing machine learning systems. And Giorgio was a recent intern at Microsoft, um, where he helped us assess some large language models. That's why we're together. But today we're just going to cover some operational guidance. So we're maybe going to do less of the machine learning theory, and we're going to talk about just operational guidance, things that you need to consider um, when you're attacking machine learning models. So best practices, where to start. If you know absolutely nothing, um, some of these slides will be for you, where you can just go and find an algorithm and try and run it against a model. We're gonna cover some terms and gotchas, things that I didn't know when I started um, attacking machine learning um, that Giorgio definitely knows being, being a PhD student. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about building long-term capabilities. So how you can build sort of an assessment program, um, how you can go about uh, building TTPs and, and building sort of the relationship between offensive security and machine learning. And really, Giorgio is is here. So I come from the offensive side, um, where you know I was hacking networks in Active Directory, things like that. And Giorgio comes from the pure adversarial machine learning side, being a PhD student. So I'll cover the operational things, and Giorgio is going to cover the the formal um, academic things. But he also has uh, an, um, quite a bit of experience attacking machine learning um, against real world systems. And I don't really need to introduce machine learning um, to you. I think we we all know, we've all heard of it. Uh, we all know it is in in every, everything, agriculture, teaching, um, authentication, deciding whether or not your cat is cute, medicine, all kinds of things. Uh, but even though the things are a lot, they're very complicated, or it would seem that machine learning is complicated. And to a point it is, uh, when you look at the math, I think, you know, algorithms are empty. And... I think the reason machine learning is everywhere is because algorithms are empty. So the math will take care of itself. You just need to break whatever problem it is down into some representation that an algorithm can work on. Um, and then you can train a model. So while algorithms are empty, models are not. Models are a representation of the data that you train on. Um, and this has implications for security. So if you train a model that has private information in it, uh, that model you know, has private information and it. it's just a different representation of data than perhaps a database. Maybe we're used to thinking of. Um, but I think, you know, the problem is that we in security hear about machine learning from vendors. And so our opinion of machine learning is often shaped by an outside party, people just using machine learning um, to in their products for security purposes. And this is maybe where we're most familiar with it. And this is a slide that I did for besides um, Salt Lake City talk, and it's kind of joking, but it is definitely true. Um, you know, in our opinions of machine learning, uh, when they're being used in security products, is a secondary concern in this conversation. Um, you'll be pleased to know there's terrible machine learning everywhere, and it's not just in security products. And so, when we talk about machine learning, the security of machine learning, uh, I think I would ask you to you know, remove your perception. Uh, of the marketing that you hear, or, you know, machine learning gets blamed for that marketing. And so when we talk about adversarial machine learning, uh, I do some slides where I talk about offensive machine learning, and I count adversarial machine learning under that umbrella of offensive machine learning, where offensive machine learning, you're using, you know, machine learning techniques for offense. Um, this is just my personal, Georgia might have a different opinion coming from <laughs> the more formal offense uh, adversarial side, but I say it's just a, it's a sub discipline that specifically attacks ML algorithms. And there's a number of uh, use cases for this. And it's, you know, you can find large, uh, you can find PII in large language models. So if you think about GPT-3 or GPT-4 or any large language models coming out, you know, they've been shown to memorize training data and if you know social security numbers or credit cards or what have you are in that training data um, or in the large data sets that they use like common crawl you can retrieve those uh, you can bypass classifiers and you know where this is probably where security people are most familiar 
you know, malware classifiers, spam classifiers, um, fraud classifiers, uh, things that classify your authentication, uh, your traffic, let you into web applications and whatnot. We even have denial of service. So there are particular samples um, called sponge examples that um, take an algorithm longer to compute than others. You can also fun functional extraction. You, know, you can steal a model. Um, you could steal a model, put it up on your own API and build a service around it. You could steal a model and then go use it for um, other types of attacks like bypassing classifiers. Uh, and all of these techniques are available on, in research, in academia. And at first, when I first started attacking machine learning models, you know, a lot of the papers are on archive and you have to have some knowledge of machine learning to really know what's going on. And you, I think as security people, we complain that things aren't real world. But, you know, in reality, it was never the academic's job or the academic researcher's job to make it real world. Um, it's, it's our job as offensive security professionals to make those real world, to translate that research um, into real world attacks um, that get the attention that these techniques deserve. So I have some questions uh, for the security folks in the room. Um, in your mind, how does a model representation of data align with your understanding of current risk frameworks? So if you take a database full of data, train a model and then serve it through an API, you know, can you, for example, for GDPR, can you delete a data point out of that model? You know, for ISO, what, what does ISO say about um, how that model should be secured? And we don't have answers for this. Like that's, that's kind of, you know, why we're here and what we're talking about. But there are frameworks that are coming and there are a lot of um, standards that are coming. So I think it would be um, prudent to start looking at this inside your organization and seeing um, what security measures already transfer across. And then whose responsibility is it, right? So if machine learning is an ML, is an information system, who's responsible for securing it? Is it the data scientists? Is it the ML engineers? Or is it the security organization? Uh, and my opinion, being a security person would obviously be the, secu it's the security person's job or the security organization's job um, to secure it and you know, get an eye on it. So next, we're going to talk about um, some attacks on machine learning. OK, so let's, let's look at some of the uh, possible attacks that the adversarial machine learning literature has studied over the years. Um, so there are essentially two main uh, stages at which uh, an adversary can try to uh, attack a machine learning system. Uh, there is um, a moment before deployment, uh, in, in which case the adversary tampers with the learning process, and this is commonly referred to as a poisoning attack. And there is a stage after the deployment uh, where the adversary can um, target like a large number of different objectives. And those objectives vary from uh, just inducing a misclassification uh, for a specific data instance, and we call that an evasion attack. Um, to something like inferring characteristics about the training set classes, uh, and we, in which case we talk about model inversion. And we're going to look at these uh, categories in a little bit uh, more depth, um, but we're going to focus uh, essentially on um, low uh, information version of these attacks. That is, we are assuming that the adversary uh, essentially doesn't have access to the original model in most cases and is mostly limited to just querying uh, the model through an API. And this is because uh, this is the most common variation uh, of the attacks that you may be interested in, that you may be able to carry out in a practical sense. And we're also uh, trying to suggest some pointers to uh, some um, practical methods uh, for, carry out, for carrying out these attacks that are implemented in uh, IBM's Adversarial Robustness Toolbox, which is a famous uh, collection of tools for adversarial machine learning. 
The first one we have is extraction. Uh, and extraction, in my opinion, is the most foundational attack primitive. So it's the easiest in terms of um, what you need to get started. You're effectively uh, stealing, you know, you're effectively getting a data set, having a target model label it, and then training um, your own model. And you're just trying to create a functional equivalent. And it's really nice from an OPSEC perspective because you what you get control all, over all the inputs. So there's not an algorithm that's generating inputs to send to the model. So you get control. You can there's a nice one to one ratio. There are no adversarial examples that get sent. So in the future, when there are detections for these things, um, a lot of your traffic is going to look normal. Once you have an offline model, you can transfer it to other places. So, you know, in this example where we have that, that proof point attack, um, you, could, you could potentially take this, well, you could take this model and then you could go and um, run it, you know, do a similar um, attack against, you know, Mimecast or another spam filter. And, you know, you're, each time you copy it, you're going to have to send less and less traffic. So you kind of gain some um, efficiency there. It just provides you, it provides you the most options in that you can take, you know, an offline, you can take your copycat model and then you can run the same attacks offline as you would online. So you can gain some insight um, there. And it's just, it's a really simple attack. Um, and it's, I would say, extremely effective. So if you know nothing else and, you know, the math is a bit frightening, I think this is, you know, going to be your bread and butter for a while. So in order to execute an extraction, the adversary starts with an initial data set, which is potentially small, much smaller than the one used in the actual training phase of the victim model. But this, um, and this uh, initial data set doesn't have to come from the same training set, but it should uh, try to reflect as close as possible the original data distribution used for the uh, victim model. And the adversary also needs the ability to submit uh, inputs to the model, obviously, and observe the outputs. Um, the process is iterative. The adversary um, can uh, augment uh, their local data set uh, and then send uh, this local information to the model to collect uh, stolen labels. Uh, so label from for those data points. And these uh, new labels can then be used to uh, actually train a copycat of the uh, victim model. A couple of import, uh, interesting algorithms to uh, um, carry out these attacks are copycat CNN from Correa Silva and others, and uh, functionally equivalent extractions from Jagielski and others. And you should uh, consider using extraction attacks uh, whenever uh, whenever you can, essentially, whenever you have the ability to query the model with uh, a large number of inputs. Um, it is often uh, a very valuable um, outcome to try to create a local copy of the victim model. Next, we have an evasion attack. So this is adversarial machine learning 101. And I would say it's most concerned with bypassing classifiers. But you know, if you were to look up adversarial machine learning on Google, this is what you're going to find. Um, from an operational perspective, you only have control over the initial samples. Um, from then on, an algorithm is going to make changes and send traffic to your target and try and um, figure out what it needs to change to get the label to switch. Uh, you also get some noisy inputs, so you don't always have um, control. And we'll talk about some of the, this later, but you, the initial image might look like noise versus that original image of a tractor or a koala. So, you know, once it takes in that image, you kind of have very limited control about what it does to it. So it, from a detection standpoint, you know, if, if some machine learning engineers looking in their application, all of a sudden they start seeing images that look like TV static, right? That that's an indication that something might be um, wrong. Uh, it's more direct than extraction. So, you know, rather than having to go through uh, an intermediary process of creating a copycat model, um, it just interacts with the target model directly. Um, and 
there are lots of variations and it will work with a given number of queries. Um, it will work, but you, you really don't have any idea about how many queries that is. So it could be um, 500, it could be 5,000. If you get the parameters right, then it could be 50. So uh, it's, I think it is a better attack than extraction if you have the right parameters, but the cost of getting those parameters um, is relatively high as opposed to just starting with an extraction attack in the previous. So as uh, while the core idea, as Will mentioned, uh, behind the vision attack is conceptually quite simple, uh, the implementation of these attacks in limited knowledge scenarios can get a little complex. Um, essentially, in general, the adversary starts with a target sample and uh, that for which uh, the adversary wants to uh, construct a perturbation that will force the classifier to uh, misclassify this sample. And uh, the adversary also is assumed to have a the ability to modify the sample to some extent and uh, query the model. And uh, the, this is um, an iterative optimization process where um, at least for uh, most uh, limited knowledge uh, evasion attacks. Uh, and this optimization process uses the output of the victim model on the modified sample uh, to guide uh, successive changes towards the direction that increases uh, loss uh, over um, the, the target point. And um, the result obviously is a perturbation and a perturbed point uh, that would be misclassified. And there are actually uh, a large quantity of different uh, types of evasion attacks. There are um, targeted evasion attacks where the adversary wants to um, change the output label from the true label to a specific target label, uh, in this case, from airport, airport to stadium. Uh, but there are also untargeted evasion attacks where uh, any, tar any uh, label return that is different from the true label is considered a successful evasion. And it is also known that evasion attack tend to transfer. Uh, so once an uh, adversarial sample is found for a specific model, um, then it often transfers to a model trained on slightly different data or trained with slightly different architectures. Um, the, uh, a couple of uh, powerful algorithms to uh, carry out these kind of attacks are hop, skip, jump, uh, this is worked by Chen and others, and it required hard labels uh, that are essentially, um, it assumes hard labels. So essentially the output of the model is just a numerical label. And uh, square attack, uh, which is worked by Andrew Shenko and others, uh, in which case the adversary uh, is assumed to have access to the uh, uh, scores that uh, the model, the victim model uh, returns in output. Um, and uh, this is again an iterative process uh, to find the basic samples. And uh, you would obviously use this kind of attacks to bypass a classifier, for instance, a spam or a malware classifier. This next one, um, inversion. So you're recovering training data from a trained model. Um, but in the image setting, it really can only reconstruct a representation of that image. So it doesn't actually get the original training image. Um, but in large language model settings, um, it becomes really interesting when you start talking about large language models um, memorizing input. Um, and really, it's a privacy attack. So you're looking for a privacy violation. In, in this case, the adversary is assumed to have uh, the ability, again, to query the model. And in this case, uh, they need the ability to obtain confidence scores on the prediction. Uh, and they also need to know the label uh, for which they are trying to reconstruct a representative sample. And uh, this, uh, this is an optimization process where uh, the point is sent to the victim model to 
collect information and then modify it in order to maximize the confidence of the victim of the victim model on that point towards the target class, the target label. And at the end of this uh, iterative optimization process, the original uh, point, the original image is modified to encode meaningful features uh, of the target class. And an example of this is the MiFace attack by Fredrickson and others. Um, next, we have inference. And really, you're looking to determine if a, a training point or a data point was in a training set. And it exploits you know, the confidence about um, or a model's confidence about an input that it's seen before. Um, there are two types of um, inference. We're going to only cover membership inference. Uh, but really here, you're just looking for the triangulation of information. So a lot of the literature talks about having access to the training set because they have access to the training set. Um, but if you imagine, right, there's a lot of um, data that you can pull off the internet. Sorrel, for example, and it's a big malware, it's got eight terabytes of malware in it. So if you were looking to see if a particular um, data point, let's say your malware was in the Sorrel data set, you could you know, run this attack against that classifier um, and see if your malware or infer if your, your malware is in it. Um, though, you know, if your malware is in Sorrel, it was already in the data set, you'd be able to see it. You just have to search through that eight terabytes. Um, so really this is useful, you know, if in a black box setting, um, where you're maybe trying to gain some additional insight or an additional edge or additional information into a, the target system. For uh, membership inference attacks, um, the uh, as we mentioned, exploit the observation that a machine learning model uh, behaves differently uh, when it encounters a data point that it has already seen in the training set um, versus uh, when, when that uh, new point is observed for the first time during testing. Um, the um, process uh, is a little complex, but the attacker would essentially use the outputs of the victim models on uh, a starting data point um, to uh, try and build local shadow models um, for each class, and then use the ensemble of these models to train a classifier that um, discovers whether the target point is part of the training set or not. Uh, a powerful algorithm to do this in a um, label-only uh, setting is uh, the label-only boundary distance attacks by uh, Shoket Chu and others. And essentially, as we mentioned, this is a privacy leakage attack. Uh, so you should use it when there is a gain uh, to be made by inferring private information about uh, some participant in the training set of a specific victim model. And finally, we have poisoning. And poisoning is you know, effectively just the influence in the creation or the acceptance of a model um, while it's in deployment. So we're most familiar with this in a supply chain context. If you think of the recent SolarWinds attacks, this is that for machine learning. Um, and there's a number of different ways that you can poison a model, but it it's it requires the most access to a system. So you know, you, or you need to have an ability to inject data into a training set. So you know, th there are um, there are way ways you could do this. You know, in a black box fashion, but you you don't know unless you know how that data is being processed um, through that pipeline and where it's going to be. Um, given back to you, it can be really difficult to know whether or not you've been successful. And so this is, I would say, the, the hardest um, attack to pull off just in terms of the, act, the type of access you need, the type of feedback you need to know if you're successful, and then also just the understanding of, of what needs to happen. So, uh, yeah, as we mentioned, critical for carrying out uh, any form of poisoning attack is the ability to alter in some way the training process. Now, there are uh, there is a wide spectrum of possible um, objectives for poisoning attacks, varying from uh, very um, high impact, widespread um, 
similar to denial of service uh, objective that is often referred to as a availability poisoning to very specific targeted um, attacks that uh, make the model misclassify uh, just one or a few instances um, of, uh, of the test set, and in which case we talk about targeted poisoning attacks. There, there are also vector attacks where um, the uh, attacker also has um, wants to induce the model to associate a specific trigger, backdoor trigger, uh, with a specific class. And this kind of attack requires the ability to also modify the point at testing time. And again, usually the way in which the attack, uh, attacker tampers with the training process is by injecting or modifying data in the training set. And uh, a couple of uh, algorithms for doing these uh, kind of attacks are bednets, um, which is a vector style attack by Gu and others, and the uh, bullseye polytope attack. Um, and uh, the, uh, when you would use it is uh, strictly during the training phase. So if you want to um, uh, condition the final uh, model that will be deployed. So, so that's an overview of the attacks. So all of the algorithms we gave in the previous section, those are all in art and they're all black box attacks. And so you can go and run those now against you know any model you find, I'd say with the exception of poisoning, because you do need some access there. Um, but those should be available to you. So next we're just going to talk about some um, terms and things that I was unaware of when I started. And fortunately, we have Giorgio here to ex explain them um, for us. So first, we're going to do hard versus soft labels. Yes. So this is, refers to the output of the victim model. Um, and we kind of covered this before, but essentially, um, information about the confidence of the model or the probabilities uh, returned by the model are uh, often very useful for adversarial machine learning um, and for essentially running attacks in general. Uh, because these uh, soft labels, as they're called, provide information about in which direction um, the changes, the perturbation to a point, are moving the classification output. So from an attacker point of view, uh, obviously more information is essentially always better. Um, and uh, it is very useful to know that uh, a specific perturbation that you are applying to your um, uh, target point is moving, for instance, the classification um, from the original label of cat to uh, more like a dog. Next, lossy compression. So if you imagine during an evasion attack, you know, you have run an attack against a class, a malware classifier, let's say, and or in this case, an image, uh, and you save your image as a, a JPEG. And during the save, that writing to disk, JPEG is going to run a compression algorithm, and it's going to overwrite those perturbations, those changes that you made to that input. So if you've ever, you know, um, encoded a payload and then tried to decode it on the other side and wondered why it didn't work. Uh, this would be that process where you uh, encode your payload in JPEG and then you don't get the same thing back. Um, in this next one, um, the algorithmic behavior. So just like in offensive security, you know, with malware, you should really understand how your tools work. Uh, this is the same thing. So however you initialize like um, an algorithm, right? you don't have control necessarily over how it gets uh, initialized or what it is with the first sample or the information it needs. And so if, sometimes, for example, if, if you're not aware of it, like I wasn't, um, a hop, skip, jump attack can either give you the first image as a really noisy image where you know if you send that off, right, your detection threshold is much higher versus if you send a, a more normal image, and that has to do with the initialization um, of the algorithm that you're using. So just being aware of, of how that traffic flow um, gets changed in the, middle of a, in the middle of an attack. 
there are also uh, many different uh, many different possible distance metrics that can be used to evaluate an attack and um, essentially to evaluate the uh, magnitude of the perturbation that is applied applied to a testing point. Um, three of the most famous ones are the Euclidean or the L2, uh, Manhattan or L1, and infinity, um, L-infinity norm. And they were um, originally used uh, because they encode uh, valuable information uh, regarding the differences that uh, the human vision system uh, can capture in uh, two different images, like a, a perturbed image. Um, but uh, you would essentially want to uh, use the correct distance metric for your specific uh, attack and for your specific data modality. So for instance, uh, the Euclidean distance may work very well for images, but may not work that well for um, different uh, data modalities like feature vectors, um, where large differences, uh, not large numerical differences in the components of the vectors uh, may not correspond uh, to large semantical differences in the actual data. So if you think about, you know, normally we might um, increase the distance between our current malicious sample and what a model thinks of a piece of malware. And normally we do it with, you know, new techniques. Like if you think about um, lull bins or application whitelisting, right? There's a lot of research into finding new ways to execute things. And what you're effectively doing there is right, increasing your distance from what's uh, a detection, like what something thinks is malicious. And it's the same process, except you know it, it's in a numerical way, and we're, you're doing it with an algorithm rather than you know uh, research that you've done. Um, so for our final um, little piece, we're just going to talk about um, the attack surface and where you can find uh, machine learning systems to attack. Um, obviously, we have our, our friend OSINT, uh, Google Dorks, uh, Shodan, Grey Hat Warfare, Buckets, right? This is an image of a bucket. So there are, or from Grey Hat Warfare, don't know where it came from. Um, a few slides, there's going to be a lot of common file types that we're going to see, and you can just search for those. Um, there's a tool that was just released by um, Al Kate fingerprinting sorry, his Lobato ML. So he has an, an, an Nmap script that will go and fingerprint servers for these things. Uh, you could go through patent documentation and then go look at the slide or go look at the archive submission that, you know, that paper, that patent references. And you can probably pull out a lot of information about how the algorithm or that, that product's working. Documentation, you know, it's fairly classic stuff. Um, inference traffic. You know, you can find a lot in inference traffic. This is how we found the proof point attack. Um, this, if you go look at the AMSI documentation, you know, it's going to say, it's going to give you a value between one and 32,768, right? So, you know, there are a number of integers that it could return. So maybe if you go look at an AMSI provider, like a CrowdStrike provider, maybe they return more information um, that you can latch onto right versus zero or one is malware isn't malware a hard label versus a softer label um you know zero through 999. so look in headers um if you if you find a numeric value in an, a seemingly arbitrary place you know that would be something to look at um it's it's kind of everywhere uh but you, you it's not it's never the it's never out front so you, it's always underneath something else There are also uh, some very common file extensions that you should look for um, that are often used to um, encode either data files, so collection uh, of data sets that are used in the training or testing of models, and um, other data files that are used for encoding uh, models for um, deploying machine learning models in real systems. Some examples are, uh, for instance, H5 and HD5, um, which are data files. Uh, CSV is obviously a very, very well-known one. Um, 
uh, NumPy files are uh, also used to um, collect data, um, while models may live in pickle files uh, or uh, ONNX files and uh, other like that. Um, and it is uh, valuable to familiarize yourself with these different um, file extensions and the frameworks uh, that are commonly using them. Uh, for instance, Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, NumPy, uh, and, and so on. And finally, um, tooling. And there is also a vast choice of tools to perform adversarial attacks, uh, defenses, and in generally to evaluate the robust robustness of models. And some uh, of these tools come from the academic community, while some of them come from industry players. Some like uh, the adversarial robustness toolbox, ART, uh, Fullbox, SecML, and Cleverhands, uh, they provide a broad range of implementations of attacks uh, that can be used um, to evaluate models. And uh, others are more specific to a single data modality, like text attack, which is um, obviously focused on um, NLP models, as the name implies. And uh, finally, there are systems like counterfeit, which merge together different adversarial machine learning libraries and uh, toolboxes to uh, expedite testing on uh, both development, development and production models by providing sort of a unified interface. And counterfeit was built uh, by us internally, and it really just it's just a wrapper for a lot of these academic frameworks. So as we've been mentioning, or as we talked about in the beginning, like this relationship between academic um, research and um, industry um, use cases, you know, I, I don't have the, the broad or the depth of knowledge that Giorgio and, and the academic community has. So I really needed a way to help um, scale, you know, my offensive knowledge and counterfeit was that was that solution for me. So it has a familiar interface. You know, if you're familiar with PowerShell Empire or, you um, Cobalt Strike, it has similar workflows, but it is it is focused on really attaching um, some algorithm to an arbitrary endpoint. So it does focus on, on black box testing um, rather than white box testing, um, if only because the majority of the tests we do are, are black box. Then finally, you know, we just want to talk quickly about some capability development. So as you're going through and you're uh, think working this through your, your operations or you're finding things in file shares um, or you're starting to look through uh, all of, look for all of the common file types that we, we put in the slide above, um, start collecting and storing data or generating data, right? There's a, there's a big uh, body of research around augmenting data. So there's a PowerShell scripts repo out there. There's a VBA macro um, data sets, nine, there's nine gigs of, of VBA macros, which I think would be a pretty powerful data set to go and steal uh, a, a classifier that you could bypass. Um, whenever you run an attack against a particular model, collect and store those successful examples, like store those parameters, store the images that come off um, of those attacks, and maybe think of them like TTPs, like that you could go and use them against another model. Um, there is a um, some research called DamageNet that has gone through and sort of mined for these adversarial examples. So you could might be a good place to start. Um, store those algorithmic parameters. So you know the parameters are make or break. So whenever you have a success, keep them. You know they're going to lower your costs long term, and you know you can't get away from the fact that you need to send traffic. So anytime you can lower those costs now or in the future, it's going to be valuable. Train and store models. So every time you run an attack, train a model alongside your attack and then store it and then use it for transferability. And then, of course, you can go build all the infrastructure to do it. And now you're just an ML engineer. So that the other side of the coin is obviously, you know, if you want to write exploits, it helps to be a developer. If you want to attack machine learning, it helps, you know, to be a PhD student, be a PhD student or um, be an ML engineer where you can automate these things. 
And you should definitely separate like your production attacks from your data collection efforts. So, you know, if you want to run a similar style proof point attack, right, don't send, you know, the templates that you would normally send, send, you know, other things, send other representative samples, or, you know, don't use your own malware, use other people's malware to get these scores. And so build separate infrastructure and then use them, use that, use that data collection infrastructure to support, you know, your ops. And finally, the conclusion um, is sort of, here's, here's the Zen. So it's like everything you can find in a model is already there. So it's been trained, um, I'd say with the exception of poisoning, obviously, everything has been trained. It's a matter of kind of computation and your ability to optimize or extract information in the most efficient way. And so unlike software, you're not going to introduce new code. You, you can't, there's, there's, you're not going to introduce new code into a trained model. You're not going to introduce new data points into a, a trained classifier unless you're in that place of poisoning. And so it's very one for one like that. And it's very, um, I think, reflective in, in that way. Um, the same techniques that are used to build are the same techniques that are used to break. And this is true sort of everywhere. So if you don't have an understanding of an algorithm or the foundational principles behind optimization, um, you're going to have a, a hard time or you're going to be uh, <laughs> a script kitty version of, an, of, of a, an attacker, right, for a while. But we all start somewhere. We all start um, with the basics, with the foundations, but that shouldn't um, deter you from from trying these things, right? If organizations are going to be implementing it, someone has to, has to secure it. And then as you go through and, and you read the literature, try and apply that white box theory to a black box setting. So as you come to more knowledge of algorithms and optimization methods, you know, go back through the white box attacks and then figure out, you know, how you could apply it in a back, black box setting. Um, and again, these attacks aren't futuristic. They're here and now, you know, I have an entire job that revolves around attacking them. Giorgio's PhD revolves around attacking these models. Um, you know, a lot of the attacks, once you get down to it, they're kind of simple. You know, there's, there is a complexity to them that is awesome, but they, they do have their roots in a strong foundation. Um, a lot of the security activities that we do to protect regular models um, transfer into the, the machine learning realm. Like the, you know, we don't have to reinvent the security wheel necessarily. There are some new things we're going to need to do, but for the majority, or at least for now, you know, we can start translating like things like logging, like that's a very basic premise. And then just that implicit relationship between Giorgio and I and academia and, and the industry, offensive security, like go and find a Giorgio who can answer questions for you. Um, academic folks are super excited to share their research and they have a really strong depth of knowledge that, um, that it's going to accelerate your learning and then just, you know, get into TTPs on, on archive and, you know, dig in. And with that, thank you for coming to our talk. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to contact us uh, on Twitter.